Well, good morning. It's been a wonderful week, although though you, you, you know you've experienced where sometimes you go away for a week and it feels like you've been gone for a month. Um, it was a wonderful month. Um, we had a great time, but it's wonderful to be home. It's wonderful to be here with all of you this morning. Please turn to the book of Colossians. And as you're turning there, please pray with me. Father, the opportunity that we have now to sit under your word, it is a rich and wonderful opportunity that is available to believers each and every week, and not only available, commanded. It is an opportunity for us to be challenged with the truth that we find, as Dick prayed earlier, in your inerrant word. We also know that it is an opportunity for those who do not know you to be confronted with the truth. We pray that your word would go out this morning boldly and profoundly and that whether it be the work of sanctification or the work of salvation, may your word do its work this morning by the empowering of your spirit. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Wisdom... Wisdom is something that everybody wants. And it's also something that everyone claims to have. Wisdom is necessary and it is needed. True wisdom, biblical wisdom, is profound. If you've ever sat with someone who knows the word and someone comes alongside them and asks questions, whether it be about the, the, the biblical truth or whether it be a believer, and they come and seeking for wisdom and how to deal with life and life's challenges, life's difficulties. And to see a man or a woman of God use the truth in such a way, such a profound way, because they know the truth, it really is, it's, it's experiencing a master at work. I don't know if you've ever seen it. There was a young man who I worked with years ago who had such a depth of understanding of the truth. He, people would come to him and ask him questions and he would use the truth in such an amazing way. It really was as if a master physician was sitting there in front of your eyes about to do surgery or doing surgery on someone with such precision, such wisdom, such carefulness, such thoughtfulness. The Word, we know, we know, we have to know, the Word has everything that we need for life and godliness. The Word is God's truth handed to the church, to the saved, to the redeemed, so that not only we would know how to live, but we would be able to help others to know how to live. We'd be able to bring that truth to the unrepentant and call them to repentance. And we'd be able to use the truth in one another's lives for the good and glory of God. We need wisdom. You all need wisdom. And we need it desperately. And where is it found? But here. It's found as you and I humbly bow our knee to God, humble ourselves to Him, sit before His Word on a daily basis, Eagerly give ourselves over to prayer and allow God's Spirit to work. Last week, we talked about discipleship. We need wisdom in order to disciple. As we talked about last week, the goal of the Great Commission is is not evangelism, that is the result. The goal of the Great Commission is discipleship. 
And I would even take it a step further. The Great Commission does not say this, but, by, but it's implied because he said, but Jesus says, teach them all that I have commanded you. Those are words of wisdom. Words of wisdom that we need. As we consider our interactions with others, believers or unbelievers, our prayers often contain within them, Lord, give me wisdom. I need wisdom from above. I need your wisdom. Wisdom is a necessary ingredient ingredient for productive, God-glorifying living. Wisdom is a moral attribute and is the art of being successful, of forming the plan to gain the desired results. Its seat is the heart, the center of moral and intellectual decision. The opposite of wisdom is foolishness, and foolishness is godlessness. Psalm 14.1, you know it. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. In its fullest sense, wisdom belongs to God alone. He is the dispenser of wisdom. Daniel, in chapter 2, verse 20, just listen. He says this, Daniel said, Let the name of God be blessed. Forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks. I give thanks and I give praise, for you have given me wisdom and power. Even now you have made me, I'm sorry, you have made known to me what we requested of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Here Daniel cries out for wisdom and God graciously gives it, but he knows who he goes. He goes to the one who gives wisdom and power. Daniel cried out and the Lord answered. And this really is the principle of James 1.5, right? But if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. What a simple verse. What a simple verse do we put it to practice. In the Bible, wisdom is personified. Proverbs chapter 1. Verse 20 says, Wisdom shouts in the street. She lifts her voice in the square. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the gates in the city, she utters her sayings. How long, O naive ones, will you love being simple-minded? And scoffers delight themselves in scoffing, and fools hate knowledge. Turn to my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you because I called you and you refused. I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention. And you neglected all my counsel and did not want my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your dread comes. When your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then, then they will call on me, but I won't answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me because they hated knowledge. And did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would not accept my counsel. They spurned all my reproof. So they shall eat of the fruit of their own way. And be satiated with their own devices. For the waywardness of the naive will kill them. And the complacency of fools will destroy them. But he who listens to me shall live securely. And will be at ease from the dead dread of evil. This is wisdom personified. What an amazing passage. And it's Proverbs chapter 1, verses 20 through 33. And I, I can't help but say as, as a father that, that my, 
O naive ones. O young foolish ones. These, this is what fills my heart as a dad, and I trust you. If you love people, if you love the saints, this is what fills your heart as you see believers in sin. Oh, naive ones. Oh, naive ones. Wisdom is spoken of as one who shouts in the streets, who is turned away from, gives blessing, reaches out to help those who are in need, but it also neglects. Verse 26 says, Wisdom laughs, mocks, ignores, and it hides. But wisdom is fully realized in Jesus. Write the verse down. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. To those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Proverbs 1, and other places as well, where, personified, where wisdom is personified. It displays to us the wisdom of God fully realized in Christ. Proverbs 1, a description of Jesus. Jesus shouted in the street. He, he was turned away from. He gave blessing. He reached out to help those who were in need and was neglected. In Proverbs 1, verse 23, the same passage that I just recently read, the psalmist says, Turn to my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. Again, it's almost, it's, it says if wisdom is speaking, but wisdom personified is Christ. So Christ is saying, turn to my reproof. Behold, I will pour my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. Dear saint, the moment God saved you, that is exactly what he did. Amen. Evidence of true saving faith is now you can understand the word. You can understand the true word of God. God given his word to you personally and you've experienced it. God saves you and all of a sudden what once was muddled, what once did not make sense, it was like trying to find gold in, in murky water. Now you see clearly. The scales are removed. What a blessing. May we dare not neglect our book. Because now we can see. Now we can see. Look at Colossians 4, verse 5 with me. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you were, should you respond. Excuse me, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Wise conduct and speech makes for profitable relationships with outsiders. That is the context of this text today, this morning. Your new relationship with Christ provides you with all the wisdom you need for wise living and wise speech and provides you for, with answers for those who need it. Wisdom is good, and it is necessary. Now, this is the fifth part of a series, A New Life Produces New Relationships. The subtitle would be, The Lordship of Christ with Outsiders. And that's really it. Are we going to commit ourselves to a text like this because we believe in the Lordship of Christ? We believe that when he saves us, now we are his, and we are demand he commands us to obey. The first command and our first point this, this morning is simply be wise with your opportunities. Be wise with your opportunities. Verse 5 begins with the word wisdom. In the New American Standard, it says, conduct yourselves with wisdom. But here, or in the, but in the, the Greek text, it actually begins with with the word wisdom. And in, in the Greek, in Greek literature, that is the place of prominence. So the verse maybe should, should read, in wisdom, conduct yourself toward outsiders. True wisdom is the application of biblical knowledge. In the New Testament, there is no place that clearly explains wisdom as in James 
chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Turn there with me. James chapter 3, verse 13. What we see in James chapter 3 is, a, is the, the contrast between true wisdom and false wisdom. True wisdom and counterfeit wisdom. And it is interesting because there is a counterfeit wisdom. There is the wisdom that the unbeliever, the world calls wisdom. And then there is true wisdom. James chapter 3 verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable. Gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Did you see the counterfeit wisdom? Earthly, natural, demonic. Earthly here refers to your earthly wisdom, rather, is it fails to, by refusal to consider God and His will. It refuses to consider God and His will. It is arrogant and it is self sufficient. It is the will that doesn't say, but doesn't hold within its heart. If the Lord wills, this or that will happen. Natural wisdom is unspiritual. It is even has the idea of animal-like. This wisdom is further described in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. And here it is unable to accept the things of the Spirit of God because it is foolishness. Demonic wisdom is exactly what it sounds like. It is devilish wisdom. That is, 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 it is in opposition to the things of God. And Proverbs 18.2 illustrates this for us. It says, A fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. We remember that an unbeliever is simply described in Scripture as a child of the devil. It doesn't mean it is as bad, he's as bad as he could be. It simply means he doesn't want anything of the one true God. The visible result of ungodly wisdom is jealousy, selfish ambition, and every evil thing. It starts off small with selfish, or I'm sorry, jealousy. And then it goes deeper into selfish ambition. You're, you're arrogant and you're, you're conceitful and you're, you only want to get your way. You don't care about anybody else. But then James even broadens it as, he, as well as deepens it by saying it produce, it's, 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 it's every evil thing. I'm going to give you a list here of, of what we see in our text of James as heavenly wisdom. First, it's pure. It's innocent and it's morally blameless. That's what it mean, when pure means. It's innocent and it's morally blameless. Heavenly wisdom is also peaceable. Peaceable. It is peace-loving and it promotes peace. That's a description of a believer. We love peace. We do whatever we need to do to be at peace with all men. Heavenly wisdom is gentle. That means it is considerate, and it even implies here patience. Heavenly wisdom is, is reasonable. Someone who is ready to obey, open to reason, and even submissive. Heavenly wisdom is full of 
mercy. This means to be filled to the fullest measure with compassion and undeserved kindness toward others. We don't show kindness just to those who show kindness to us. We show kindness to those who do not. It's not just full of mercy, but it's also full of good fruits to be filled to the fullest measure with doing good, doing good deeds. Next, it is unwavering. It is unwavering. This means to not be parted or divided in commitment and love for God and his truth. Biblical wisdom, true wisdom is undivided. There's no divided loves. And lastly, Biblical wisdom is without hypocrisy. It's real. It's just, it's real. It's sincere. It doesn't hide behind some sort of false impression. This laundry, laundry list of virtues makes up what wisdom should look like in our lives. And the command in Colossians 4 5 is the term conduct. Conduct yourself in wisdom. To live in such a way or walk in such a way. That's what it means. To conduct. And you might want to write these down. The word conduct in Colossians chapter 1 verse 10. 2 verse 6. And 3 verse 7. Each translate this same word walk. So conduct and walk are synonyms. They mean the same thing. Point being, you are to Wisely walk as you deal with outsiders. That's, that's our text. Outsiders, in a rabbinical sense, it referred to anybody who is outside of Judaism. In our context, obviously, it refers to anybody who is outside the saving work of Christ. Anybody who is outside the church. Anybody who is unsaved. In regard to being outside... 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12 and 13, tells us that we are not to judge outsiders, but who are we to judge? Insiders. Churchmen. 1 Thessalonians 4.12 reminds us that we are to behave properly toward outsiders. And he, Paul explains what he means in saying that the insider, the Christian, is to lead a, a quiet life, attend to his own business, and to work diligently. Now we can stop there for just a second because, again, our passage says to, to walk wisely or to conduct ourselves wisely toward outsiders. And here in, a, in Paul's letter to Thessalonica, he tells them how to do it, right? Right? Lead a quiet life. Attend to your own business. Don't be a busybody. And he says, work diligently. Be faithful in the workplace. In reference to an elder in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, an elder is to have an unblemished reputation with those outside the church so that he is above reproach and that accusations cannot be brought against him. Commentator William Hendrickson says, Early Christians were called atheists because they served no visible gods. They were called unpatriotic because they did not burn incense before the image of the emperor. They were called immoral because of necessity they would often meet behind locked doors. The Apostle Paul knew that the best way to defeat this slander was for Christians daily to conduct themselves not only virtuously instead of wickedly, but also wisely instead of foolishly. It was then as it is now. In the long run, the reputation of the gospel depends on the conduct of its devotees. It is as if the Apostle were saying, Behave wisely toward outsiders, always bearing in mind that though few men read the sacred scrolls, all men read you. You know you're being watched, right? You're not just being watched inside the church. 
They're being watched outside. Look back at Colossians chapter 4, verse 5. The last phrase is making the most of the opportunity. Now the word here for making the most, it means to redeem. It can also mean to deliver. It it is used when someone was to buy back an object from the workplace, or from, rather, I'm sorry, from the marketplace. Why would Paul use a term like this? Why would he say, buy back the time and make the most of every opportunity? To buy back the time, it's active. It's active. The idea is you can't sit back and wait for something to fall into your lap. You buy back the time and you make the most of every opportunity. I was just talking to a friend and we were talking about how to keep Christ on our mind all the time. How do we do it? What do we do? Do we just repeat verses over and over to ourselves? Do we, do we, do we pray without ceasing in such a way that that's supposed to keep Christ on our mind and, and who we are on our mind? We do memorize verses. We do pray without ceasing. Those are helpful. But we also consider that every step that we take, every situation that we're in, wherever we're at, we are considering where we're at. We are thoughtful regarding where we are at. We are paying attention to those who are around us, saved or unsaved, because that often, that, that, that tells us how we're supposed to respond to them, how it is that we talk to them. If we're around a bunch of unbelievers, we're not really looking for opportunities to share the gospel. We're looking for opportunities to encourage to build up in the faith. If we're around unbelievers, we're looking for opportunities or inroads for the gospel. We need to, saints, we need to buy back each and every opportunity. When you go to the grocery store, consider buying back the opportunity. When you go to the hair salon, when you go to the barber, when you're standing in line somewhere, buy back the opportunity. Prayerfully consider who's around you, what's going on. How can you be a godly example in that moment? Colossians was written about A.D. 60 to 62. Approximately five to seven years before Paul's final book, 2 Timothy, Paul understood that the end was closer now than previously. And he could have had this in the back of his mind when he wrote. There is a parallel passage to our text here in Colossians, and it's Ephesians chapter 5. Turn there with me. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Here, Paul says in Ephesians 5, verse 15, Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Here again, just a further reason, a further exhortation. It's bad, folks. It's bad, Paul's saying, Use your time well. People are dying. People are going to hell. Saints are in sin. Do something about it. We do remember, right? We are our brother's keeper. We are not an island unto ourselves. Now you have a new relationship to all things. And if you are Christ's, If you have been bought with his blood, if you are saved, 
You must be wise in every opportunity and you must buy back each and every singular opportunity to the best of your ability, to the glory of our Savior. But you must also be wise in your speech. That's our second point. Be wise with your speech. Look at Colossians chapter 4, verse 6 with me. Colossians 4, 6, Paul says, Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Now we know from previous verses in Colossians that, that the Colossians needed help with their speech. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 8 and, uh, 8 and 9, Paul rebuked them for their internal sin. Do you remember what it was? Anger, wrath, and malice. Now this internal sin morphed into external and outward sin. Slander, abusive speech, and lying. And you know how he defines these in that text? Evil. Evil. Slander, abusive speech, and lying. Satan. Satan is identified by these things, and they are evil. And just a few verses later in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, Paul exhorts them in the positive, and it says, Let the word of Christ richly dwell in you, or dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. This passage is a, is a great expression showing that what is in the heart will come out. A heart that is filled with thankfulness, that sings within, will teach and admonish others with melodious and harmonious wisdom. Also, we can't overlook the immediate context of our passage. Do you remember? In verses 2 through 4, Paul focuses on praying. This is what I want to come out of your mouths, Colossians. I want you to pray. I want you to pray. And do you remember? Do you remember what the text tells, how it tells us to pray? It doesn't say this. This was my outline, but I hope you remember. Um, We're to pray purposefully. We're to pray persistently, watchfully, thankfully. Not in that order. Persistently, watchfully, thankfully, purposefully. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, that your there is a plural your. Whether you are teaching or admonishing in a, a singular individual or a group, we're commanded to always have gracious speech. There's a word there that should stand out. The word always. Always. Let your speech always be with grace. If you're not convicted, you're sleeping. (laughs) Is your speech always gracious? Mine isn't. No matter who you are talking to, whether it be a husband or a wife, or whether it be you as a husband to your wife or you wife to your husband, whether it be to an ex-spouse, whether it be a child to a parent or a parent to a child, a boss to an employee, an employee to a boss, the rich to the poor to the poor to the rich, a friend to an enemy, or a friend to a friend, or a friend to an enemy. No matter who you are talking to, whether you are talking about good or bad experiences, whether you're talking about a rainy day or a snowy day, the joys of life or the trials of life, whether you are speaking to a believer or an unbeliever, dear saints, our speech is to be gracious. The opposite of gracious speech is abusive speech. Abusive speech is often loud and belittling. But it is also vindictive. It is judgmental. 
It is unkind, it is impatient, it is sarcastic, it is divisive, it is mocking, it is unforgiving, and it is hypocritical, as well as hypercritical. Do you remember the striking words of James chapter 3 that Dick read earlier? For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says in his speech, he's perfect. He's perfect and he's so perfect, he won't even sin with his body. Verse 5 of James chapter 3 goes on to say, So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. It is the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. What a text. Satan and his little minions somehow, in some way, through hell, through the world, through the fle- our own flesh, we use our tongue to absolutely destroy, absolutely ruin people. It is the very world of iniquity. In your mouth is an entire ecosystem in and of itself. And it can destroy. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and it is full of deadly poison. James, what a a dismal picture he paints. Right? It's like, just let me go home. Let me just go to bed and, you know, I just won't talk to anybody anymore. even though it is a dismal picture that he paints. We are commanded to speak the truth in love. Speaking truth in love is a demonstration that God is working in us. He who speaks the truth in love, Paul says, evidences a sanctified life, one who's becoming more like Christ. I've often observed that for most people, it seems as though the tongue is one of the first items that, one of the first members of our body that becomes or begins to become sanctified. It's not always as much as we want it to be, right? And of course, we still sin with our tongue, of course, James just tells us. But oftentimes, our mouths... God really addresses them at at, at salvation. And we praise the Lord for that, don't we? But we still have a lot of work. Back in Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul states that gracious speech, speech is seasoned with salt. Seasoned with salt. The term for salt, I was surprised to learn this, it's only used eight times in Scripture. Only eight times. Seven times in the synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Once in Colossians. During this time, salt was, came mostly from the Dead Sea. The ancients valued salt as a preservative and as a flavoring agent. Salt prevents corruption. It, pers- it, it preserves, but it also provides flavor and pungency. The idea here is that gracious speech is just seasoned with salt. But it is seasoned. It is meant to preserve. Your speech is meant to preserve. It is meant to to be appreciated. And it is to be enjoyed. And again, remember, this is talking about outsiders. This is talking about your speech toward unbelievers. 
It is meant to, to prevent further corruption in the unbeliever. And ideally, our goal is, it is meant to restore. That is our hope. Gracious, salty speech is tactful speech. The ability to show tact is a wonderful blessing. It is not unique to Christians, but I would say it is a virtue that we can all grow in. Some wear tact tactlessness as a badge of honor. Some look at the truth as a blunt object that is meant to bloody others. That is not the purpose of God's word. Truthfulness without tact is a clanging gong. It is a bitter apple. And it is not pleasing to the Lord or to the recipient of its lack. For the last two years of my, my, my high school, my high school days, up until my, my early 20s, I was given over to weightlifting. You might laugh, but you know, the, the big ugly, well, you might think they're ugly, I think they're still pretty interesting, but the, the big monstrous guys that you see on TV, um, I wanted to do that. I know, I know. Um, I just started out a new workout program. The program demanded of me or commanded me or urged me to uh, drink a gallon of milk a day. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so I did it. I did it. Right next to the gym that I was, I was working at, I, um, there was a little mini mart next door, and every day I'd go over and get it by the pint and drink it down. One day I walked into the, this little mini mart. I, I got my, my half pint of milk, and, um, and for some reason, I don't even, maybe because of what happened, but um, I really was looking forward to it. <coughs> and so, as I was walking out the, the doors to the Mini Mart, I opened up my carton of milk, and I began to chug. I thought I was going to die. The milk had soured. And I took two or three big gulps, you know, in my, in my zeal before my taste buds caught up. It was, the, it was the worst feeling I think I've ever had. Uh, it was awful. It was absolutely awful. Um, thankfully, I could walk back in and, you know, you want to take a drink? It's, it's sour. Can I have another, please? And he was more than eager to give me a new one. I will never, ever, ever rush into a gulp of milk like that again. But Christians, we are not to worship just in truth. We are to worship in the spirit of the truth. Do you know that the truth in and of itself does not save, nor does it sanctify? The truth in and of itself does not save, nor does it sanctify. Truth changes only when it is accompanied by the spirit of God. That is, by the power of the spirit with the fruit of the Spirit working in you and in me. Christian, you must seek for truth and for tact. You must be a man or a woman of tact. You must seek to make the truth appealing, pleasing, and a joy to come in contact with. A person of tact does not shrink back from a difficult situation. A person of tact, of tact is not a coward. A person of true biblical tact is not only unafraid to bring the truth, but he is so reliant upon God in his bringing of the truth, he does it courageously, powerfully, boldly, but with graciousness. Tactfulness is the bringing of a word in humility, patience, and kindness whether to a believer or unbeliever. Is that you? Is that you? I will say, just in my own heart, 
if I could change one thing right now, that would be what I would want to change about me. I want to be known as someone who brings the word graciously, with humility, with kindness, all the time. Proverbs 15.28 says, the, or I'm sorry, 15.23, a man has joy <clears throat> in an apt answer. And how delightful is a timely word. Proverbs 15.28 the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. In Proverbs 25, 11, like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. Are we called to think before we speak? Amen and amen. Amen. The final phrase of verse 6 says that so that you will know how you should respond to each person. This is an interesting phrase, but the term for respond can be translated answer. Answer. The point here is that wise living that is seeking to be gracious in speech will result in wisdom in knowing how to respond to those outside the faith. So really what it is, is, is wise living means that we consider our situation. We consider the circumstances. We consider who we're speaking to. We're considering whether it's the right time to speak. Men and women, and probably women most specifically, you know that. You, and this isn't, this, this, this isn't a, a compliment, men. You ladies know that timing is everything when you come to bring something to your husband, right? And men, that's true for, for the ladies as well, um, but probably more true of us. And I speak to myself here, but men, we need to be able to take it anytime. We need to be able to take our lumps when we deserve them. Often when we approach outsiders, we do so with two extremes. Either the minute that we perceive a door, a door ajar for the gospel, we bust in with guns a-blazing, killing any who are in our path. We are not gracious, we are not gentle, we are not kind, nor are we wise. Whether the door was truly open or not, we have now caused them to slam the door shut, often with, with our foot in it closing their ear to us and never allowing us to speak the truth to them again. The other extreme would be simply we just don't even go after it. We just don't even do anything. There is a biblical balance. Once when Michelle and I were dating, I was flying back from, we were, we were engaged, I was flying back from, from Florida to California and I sat next to a young man For most of our flight, we were generally quiet. And I finally built up the courage to begin a conversation. We had a really good talk. It was, it was a very encouraging talk. At the end of it, he looked at me and he said, I, 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 man, I, I really enjoyed our conversation. And I will say, he says, you're not like the rest of them. I'd really like to talk more. You don't get that very much, right? So inside, I was doing a backflip, but I maintained my composure, and we exchanged numbers, and within just a few weeks, we got together. We went out for sushi together and sat down, and um, we talked for about 90 minutes or so. By the time our, our 90 minutes was up, he looked at me, he says, I take it back. You're just like them. You're no different. You're no different. I'm leaving now and, and um, feel free to lose my number. We both walked out of that room, out of that restaurant, frustrated. I did call him. 
I asked him to forgive me for, um, for my foolishness, for my lack of sensitivity in any way that I was unkind. It wasn't the gospel that he bristled against. It was me. It was me. He never returned my call. This was tragic. Is God sovereign? Amen and amen. Is God in control of all that? May have God even used that? Could I find out in glory that that young man was saved and redeemed, maybe even later that night, maybe even two weeks later, a month later, maybe even today? And he looked at that meeting as as providential. I don't know. But that night, I was in the way. Or at least that night, I did not honor the Lord. Conduct yourselves with wisdom, Paul says, toward outsiders. Making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech Always be with grace as those seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. There are many ways for us to pray for one another. This is just another. This is a good way for us to live up or lift up our request for the body of Christ to our God who answers when we pray to him in faith that we will conduct ourselves in such a way with wisdom that unbelievers are not, a stumbling block is not placed before them because of our behavior or because of our speech. Let's pray. Father, in your goodness and kindness, this is the This is the text that you had for us this morning. And Father, Father, because of who you are, because of your your nature, your character being one of love and mercy, being one of sovereignty, being one of might and power, because you are omnipresent and because you are all-knowing, Father, with with all of your nature, with all that you are, we can trust that this is our text. This is what you wanted us to wrestle with this morning. And we can also rest assured that each who is here, each person who is here this morning, this is exactly what we needed. Father, in that we give you praise. And we pray that we will not sit back and be merely listeners, but we would be diligent to be doers. Father, in any way that we have fallen short of these commands, we confess them to you. And we, re- we, we desire to be wholeheartedly repentant. And may we be changed. So that because of our new relationship with you, we now have a new relationship with outsiders. We are different. Let us be men and women who buy back every opportunity. Let our our speech be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that we would know how to respond to each person. Father, as we go about our week this week, may you be glorified by how we interact with outsiders. And may you, do a, and may you begin and continue to do a good work in us in this regard so that we can prove ourselves again as doers of the word. Father, we pray this evening for 
And we pray now for this evening's Bless Israel. We pray that the message that would be spoken there this evening would hit the hearts of each person listening. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless our week as we seek to honor you in all things. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.